talk around whether Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman will be fiscally reckless and indulge in populist measures. As always, she's eschewed that path and actually brought down the estimates for how much India's fiscal deficit this year could be. But there are lots of questions still swirling in the political economy air around this budget. And we hope to use this opportunity to ask the Finance Minister some of those questions. She's always in full form when she comes to the India Today Business Today Budget Roundtable. So, ma'am, welcome. We have a very eager audience, some of whom are also looking forward to the opportunity to ask you questions. I want to start by asking you about what happened at the Niti Aayog meeting this morning. Uh, West Bengal Chief Minister Mamta Banerjee says, aapne unko bolne nahi diya. She spoke for five minutes, aapne audio off kar diya. She says that, you know, the Assam Chief Minister, the Chhattisgarh Chief Minister, they all spoke for 10, 12 minutes. Chandra Babu Naidu spoke for 20 minutes. They were allowed to speak, but West Bengal was silenced, the opposition was silenced, the India Alliance was silenced. Aap bolne nahi dete ho, ma'am. You've uh, sort of seen us say it all. You seem to bring in the same emotion. <laughs> um, no, I was really happy to see West Bengal Chief Minister uh, attend the Niti Aayog. And when she started to speak, she did say, I'm speaking for Bengal, I'm also speaking for all opposition. Again, I was quite uh, happy that she's taken it upon herself to be the voice. We heard her the full allotted time. Everybody, I mean, like, as we do it in nowadays all conferences, for every table there is a screen with a lot of flower arrangement and everything else. And the, at the top right-hand corner of the screen, the clock is there, the countdown begins when you start speaking. And first when it reaches zero, that is your time is over, it's in green. And after that, it becomes a red after uh, 30 seconds after you finish your time, it becomes red lettered. And at that time, Raksha Mantri Rajnath Singh Ji, who was running the whole meeting, he was playing the compare, with his uh, pencil or pen, you should tap on his mic just to say, your time's over. And every chief minister that you referred to would say, sir, one more minute. <laughs> and they would, there was no question asked, they would continue. That one more minute might be five minutes or ten minutes. Uh, it's all right. There was never a second question asked saying, no, no, it's over, you stop it. Nothing like that. They were allowed to continue. And therefore, the West Bengal chief minister spoke her time. And if she required to say anything more, even as Rajnath Singh she tapped on the mic. She could have said, no, I have something more to say. No way anyone would have stopped her. But she chose to, and I say this deliberately with some thought. She chose to say, no, I'll stop talking. And within a minute, got up from her seat and went away. Well, it's her choice. But I was stunned when she went away went out and said to the media that I walked out of this because they didn't allow me to speak. How untrue can this be? So, I'm happy to have heard her. I wish she took more time to say all that she wanted to say. We were all listening to her. And when she came in, much before the meeting started, it was such an amiable, oh, hello, namaste, and all that. She came, stood together with all of us, took a picture. And I remember some of uh, the people around were saying, are you all right, what's happened? She had a little band-aid here somewhere. People said, are you all right, did you get yourself hurt and all that. There was never this feeling of there's something, you know, ruining. But that's what happened. Sort of, you have a follow-up on this? Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, in the context of this and uh, what happened today, I am reminded of the economic survey which talks, uh, you know, repeatedly about a <coughs> tripartite compact. And that, uh, you know, in fact, we asked at the earlier sessions also to the budget makers along with you, the secretaries, uh, that, you know, it's this budget and the economic survey very clearly says it cannot alone be the job of the center. It is the government's center, state, and the private sector. But in the context of what has happened today, 
what is your sense how how optimistic are you that the state governments will actually and i'm talking about uh, obviously the opposition states uh, will actually buy into this uh, optimism and hope which the economic survey has shown i'm very optimistic it's one thing that many of the opposition party led governments did not come for the niti aayog's meeting i can understand it but when it comes at least in my last 5 years and they were not simple ordinary 5 years covid borrowing money paying for the gst we couldn't pay and now repaying it with the consent every time each time of the gst council and so on i am very confident that aside from all these filibustering there will be states and center working together on most things they can always be a situation where let's say like the i'm taking an example not because we are talking about mamta banerji ji today but uh, the example of uh, uh, mahatma gandhi rural employment guarantee scheme about which payment is not been made west bengal complaints and the cag report comes so in this sort of situation there will be friction because knowing that there's been something wrong center wouldn't want to give the money and then also uh, seek explanation and everything else these sort of on and off things will probably will happen but otherwise i have found working together with states particularly the officials who come and work for the actual nitty gritties of the whole thing things do go very well i i don't think there is a major problem with most states i quote one of the things which of course today parties and the parties to which such people move Uh, are all different now i remember punjab in uh, gst council with the state government being under congress early days of me being in the finance ministry had a lot of problems and some dues which were to be given to punjab hadn't been given the finance minister in the gst council was very assertive but he was a very gentleman like but very strong words and there were a lot of arguments over it but i took it upon myself because i thought it was my duty to work together with the team and get the payment given to them he was equally generous to come back to say i didn't expect this to happen it's happened i'm very grateful it's a different story that that minister is no longer no, no longer in congress but there are uh, you know beyond the political differences people do work together see the uh, finance minister uh, continuing this point uh, many people here would know and our audience would certainly that out of every 100 rupees that the center spends uh, almost 20 rupees 19.6 is the devolution to the states that you give and there are other forms of centrally sponsored schemes indirect taxation the larger question is that one uh, states are constantly saying that they need more share of the revenue and that there is discrimination with south india and therefore do you feel that you now need to one increase the devolution to the state so that you let them do their own thing and also address this problem of the north versus south divide that has crept into the political debate increasing or decreasing the devolution is not my business what the finance commission tells me to do i do it and that has to be done for the 5 years for which the finance commission's recommendation come and based on that i have to do it the next finance commission may change the terms and ask me to do more or ask me to do less again i'll have to follow that advice given by the finance commission so to increase it or to decrease it when i don't have the power where is this question of discriminating the finance commission has told me to give something to some state as per a formula every month i keep giving it as per the formula you want to change the formula please talk to the finance commission not to me i have made this plain to some of the states who seem to want to do politics with it but everyone who speaks about it equally knows that this is not something which the finance ministry has any power over it is the finance commissions the new commission is constituted i will actively request all the states to go and engage with the finance commission highlight where they think they are being discriminated against and ask the formulation to be changed 
That's it. So that is one thing. All the South Indian states. I come from the South, born in one state, married into another, both of the South India. I know in some parameters, states in the South have done better for themselves. And I know also that almost two, 14th and the 15th Finance Commissions, have not blindly used just the population data to calculate the formulation, because if they did use only the population data blindly, meaning use the 71 census and not use the 2011, or use the 2011 much against the interests of the South Indian states, then we can blame, saying there's not been any consideration. Whether the consideration was adequate or not is a different debate. That there was no consideration at all cannot be the case because two finance commissions, 14th and 15th, if I remember correct, have used the population data based on 71 and amended it for some criteria by using 2011 data and said if the weightage is not reflective of the decline in population, the total fertility replacement rate, if it is not reflective of that, they'll have to do some adjustment and therefore did bring in the latest census so that it doesn't go adversely against some of the states which, let's say, in population parameters have declining population. But it may not be sufficient. I grant that. Therefore, the debate of how states should not be disincentivized for good performance on any criteria inclusive of population there should be a case presented to the Finance Commission by every state which wants to speak about it. And therefore, to say South Indian states as a bloc have been denied their right is, is to say, look, we didn't put forth our case well before the Finance Commission, and therefore it hasn't worked, rather than say, you in the central government today are discriminating against states in the southern part of the country. That's absolutely wrong. I do not have any power to do according to my whims and fancies, saying, oh, I like Telangana, so I will give them, but I don't like Kerala, so no chance. And the people who are speaking about it know it very well, but still we'll talk, because unfortunately, some of us who can do a bit more homework and say the truth, either say it with a time lag, or don't bother because, Chodo yar, who's do bothered? They are fighting, they are having their quarrel, let them have it, and we go away. So that narrative gets traction. And that's what which we go on repeatedly saying, oh, South states in South India ask, Hurry, let's do some homework, please. Ma'am, we now want to come to Nokrinomics, which seems to be the central thrust of this budget. You mentioned the word jobs, employment, 23 times. Last budget was mentioned three times. So one is that this is a side effect of the general elections where the BJP government has belatedly acknowledged that there is a job crisis. Before this, the charge against you is that your government was in denial about the enormity of the job challenge, that you were trying to underplay it. Now this result has given your rude wake-up call that there is a big challenge. Uh, the second is that some of these ideas, like the employment-linked incentive, uh, the apprenticeship stroke uh, internship program, are lifted from the Congress's manifesto. idea copy the third point I want to ask you about is that the financial incentives that you've given, how confident are you that these are trigger enough for net incremental new job creation? The point I'm making is that if you give a company 15,000 rupees, uh, do you think this will create new job avenues which wouldn't have existed otherwise? Because companies typically decide how many people they wish to hire based on demand, based on revenue, based on their projections. Will a government incentive of this nature actually, in your view, produce new jobs? Yes, it will, because even as we are telling them to 
benefit from the incentives that we are giving. We are giving monthly EPFO payments. We are giving one month salary um, up to 15,000 rupees, irrespective of the salary for which the person is recruited. And very clearly saying, it has to be a new addition to the job. And that new addition will have to be enrolled into the EPFO. So we are not looking at checking it by the handwritten note that he may send us. It is a formal introduction into the EPFO. Second, the employer is also incentivized in this process when he brings in new people, new, new people who is a fresher, meaning first-time job seeker. And second scheme is you can bring in anybody, also include the newcomers. Uh, and these are very clearly telling them that you're not going to show the existing employees and take this incentive. You will have to bring the new one. And APFO very clearly has only unique numbers, so no replication can happen there. So we are confident that it is possible for, for us to monitor it and check up if these additions. And these are not small additions. MSME units do think this kind of a incentivizing employee share of the EPFO, employer share of EPFO, and give the employees first wage are all big steps for a government to offer. So we are confident that it and will And your work. response to the political charge that this is a side effect of the general election results, that before this, your government was supposedly in denial about the enormity of the job crisis, these results have come as a rude awakening. If I say this, uh, it might be too late for you to accept that I'm saying the truth, but it is all in records. You can always check it up. Since 2014, every cabinet proposal which goes to the cabinet, it hadn't existed before. PM very clearly would say, it's all right, you've given me all the justification for the proposal to come to the cabinet. What I want you to give additionally is to tell me how much direct jobs will this create, how many indirect jobs will it create. And many proposals in 2014 onwards, 14, 15, and I think by 16 all of us got into the group, we had to go back and work out to see how many jobs that would create. So with that proposal, only we reach the cabinet every time, one. Second, for the positions which were lying unfilled in government, sanctioned positions lying vacant. Between November 22 and December 23, every month through Rosgar Mela, people were given appointment letters for jobs. So if we didn't take jobs and necessity of filling up the post seriously, why would we do this? If we didn't think jobs were an important element of the economy, why would our cabinet notes have to have a section talking about what will, what will be the impact on jobs. So that's not a right uh, allegation. I'm giving you concrete examples. And again, for us to be told, oh, you've copied it from Congress's uh, manifesto, I want to say, it's very convenient and lazy argument to put forward because, for instance, and also because the allegations come every day, one in the morning, and the next day the opposite allegation on the same matter comes next day. For instance, they said they would give apprenticeship as a right and that they would give a thousand rupees, I think, in, the, in their manifesto. But now when we give it for people so that they'll be there for one year, every month being paid by the central government and the company also making sure that they will have them uh, for 12 full months, in the earlier scheme where the EPFO linked one, we've also said that you take all the incentives, but if you remove the fellow, you refund the amount which, with, which has been given to the uh, employer. So in this uh, apprenticeship, when we now bring it in, they say, oh, but a oh, job todina hai. You're only doing apprenticeship, and therefore you're not creating jobs. But you made apprenticeship as a huck. You said it's a right. So apprenticeship is not job when we give it, but apprenticeship has to be made a right per their manifesto. Can there be a greater doublespeak, hypocritical way of criticizing others? So I'm not surprised now 
they have found a newfound aggression in the way in which they want to be an opposition. Opposition has to be strong, firm, uh, putting forth the arguments well and so on. But this kind of a false narrative building and aggression about it and go on repeating the lies several times is now the formula for India's primary opposition. I'm sure all of us can be conscious of it. See that. Uh, Finance Minister, uh, when you started off delivering budgets, I remember uh, uh, these questions must have been put to you, where is the big budget? But I want to go back to the example of 100 rupees that the government spends and uh, through that ask you a question that out of 100 rupees, almost 51 rupees, 50 paisa is going to the states, it's going into paying back interest and other items. And even the remaining 48.5 is committed on all heads, rural, education, agriculture, GDP, uh, and other uh, matters. Is it time that all of us realize that the center can only do so much and that unless you raise taxes very significantly, you don't have that much surplus funds to give away and make the middle class very happy, which seems to be a bit upset after the budget, at least some sections of the middle class. And your bhakts also seem very upset, which is something I find very interesting. They say Modi ka parivar and you know big bhag, this that and then they're very unhappy. When you look at your responses on Twitter and social media, what are you making? These are people who've been fiercely supportive of the BJP and the Prime Minister and this government. They seem to say Nirmala Ji na mu ka mazaj kharab kar diya. Tax lag. I want to ask, where did I tax laga ke business? Where did I laga o tax? So, on futures and options, you've increased Wait a minute. Uh, and who are these bhaktas? So-called middle class, right? Futures and option is for middle class. Please don't mind me saying, why can't middle class be there? Of course they can be there. But futures and options go with risk. I'm not saying middle class shouldn't go into options or futures. And there, what is it that we've done? What kind of an increase? So, for options, it's even lesser. In futures, it's a bit, it's doubled from 0 0.0125, it's gone to 0 0.2. But no, that's one tax. All right, then. Ma'am, your supporters are deeply upset with the fact that indexation benefits have been removed on long term capital gains tax for real estate. Yeah, we bought the money. When they were sitting, when you were coming, they said, you should ask this question. In real estate, you have removed your indexation. You know, people are really, really agitated. They think that, you know, this is not the right thing to have done. Why not? Because it also comes as a surprise. Because when somebody makes an investment... Tax is always given as an advance notice. Uh, ma'am, no, the why not, year, why not... Why not... To, to, Whoever says about tax no, in advance... To, Ma'am, no. to, to interrupt on the why not, please pardon me for that, is because there are lots of people who are saying black money will come back. People will under-report the formal size of the transaction and cash will be back, which since 2016 this government has gone hammer and tongs after, which is very good. That is why the question on indexation removal for no, housing. Wait a minute. It's nice to conflate many things onto this debate. Haven't we as a country kept saying why all this differentiation between the different asset class? Why can't it be simple? Why don't you rationalize it? That's been one of the very strong arguments. No, in gold, the treatment is like that. In property, it is like this. In stocks, it's something's different. And the rates are also different. I remember people telling me, see, the TCS, TDS, me itni sare rates kyu hai bhai? And again, for middle class, I said, if there is TCS, you can carry it forward as a credit if you want into your TDS also. All inputs which I've heard from middle class all these years, I want to respond to uh, comments which have come to me. So when I'm asking you if I should treat all the asset class equally, with one being one thing, another, being, another thing being a bother, can we treat it all similarly? That's exactly what we've done. Because your promise was of continuity and predictability. Mm. Now, but let's for example, now. you've increased the long-term capital gains on equity from 10 to 12 and a half. Now, I am concerned. In the US, it's 
Now, you, your, your budget makers have said you intend to keep it 12 and a half, but you said in taxation there's always some unpredictability. Next year, if there is some revenue compulsion or two years later from 12 and a half it could become 15. Could be when somebody makes an investment decision, he has some sense of what the tax outflow will be as a result of that by taking indexation away. Now, people have invested for many years in the real estate sector in the, in the expectation that when they exit, this is the tax and this is the indexation benefit that they'll get. Suddenly, you don't know where the ball is coming from. So the stability argument versus the simplicity argument. I have announced in the budget for the next six months there will be a committee looking into simplifying direct taxation. If I'm doing one thing now and also the rest of it will be done through the committee, it will happen. So there is no scope in the name of stability even to respond to the re requirement of make your tax system simple. I will have to change it sometime, no? At some point in time, will I have to change it or not? Or, in the name of stability, never change it, even if it is complex. It can't be that way. It has to, and again, I did say, not a perfect example to compare. When GST was brought in, rates which existed before, different states, different rates. All officers sat together over several sessions to understand how in some state, which was in 8, 9, 10, 11 percent, to what rate will it go? The nearest to which GST offers. And the thumb rule there was, we don't want additional revenue. But the Taxpayers should not be paying a higher rate. So you try to rationalize it by using one understanding that it shall be revenue neutral. Any movement from one rate to another, at that time that was the principle. The revenue neutrality principle was broadly used even now. 10 come to, uh, 20 can come down to 12.5. 10 went up to 12.5 for the stocks. With the rationalization, on an average, over the several years, we've calculated and took very many different examples, and after that only, this 12.5 was arrived at. And immediately after the budget, the income tax, CBDT, has been releasing note after the note and frequently asked questions answered on why these amounts, why this rate was decided. It was not with the revenue consideration thought in my mind. Clearly to simplify and clearly to rationalize. Ma'am, let's come back to the f and point uh, for a while. Uh, you know, uh, the SEBI chairperson recently made a very clear observation that it is now no longer an investor-related problem. It is becoming a systemic risk. It is becoming a risk for the macro econ economy itself because savers are now not going into capital formation through this. They are going into speculation. Now, you have, you have what the budget makers have said, that you've nudged it. From your budget point of view, you've given a nudge to the investor saying that there is a risk here and therefore you've also uh, attempted to get revenue out of that. What is your sense? Because you, you, know, you are aware that if somebody is a speculator, they will speculate no matter what. You might want to increase the tax, but there will be that, that tendency. Are you worried that this is becoming a little bit of a, a serious case of a bubble? Well, I strongly believe SEBI is very well equipped to take care of that. They have been very clear that their regulation will be only a soft touch regulation. And before they frame any kind of a rule or a you know, measure to control anything, they would have consultations prior to even drafting their regulations, consultation with the stakeholders. So that should be sufficient. What we've done is, because of the kind of request which came, a little nudge. And that's why the rates are not really all that big, just a little. And somebody was telling me this morning, but it hasn't helped, so why did you have to bring it? I said, why didn't it help? Look at the way stock market is today. 
So I'm not going by any of these comments. But the SEBI is fully vested to take care of it. But that's also reflecting in the bank deposit problem, uh, ma'am. Because the CASA deposits are also, I mean, if savings and deposits are going into uh, the, the markets and in, in speculation, banks are really struggling at the bottom end in terms of CASA deposits. How are you looking at that? Banks should go ahead and ask for more deposits. They should do deposit collection. Ma'am, since you mentioned that, look at how the stock markets are doing. You know, during the elections, it became a big controversy where the Prime Minister and the Home Minister both said, you know, kharid lo, election ke results ke baad market ka bhaab bhaab chalne wala. That became a big issue as to why two of the senior most politicians were talking up uh, stock markets. Now, given the fact that you've increased uh, the taxation, is this a subtle nudge that the government is concerned about the froth that was building on account of speculative activities and the subtle nudge to investors, particularly these daytime speculative traders, that this is not something the government is very comfortable with? No, but that, that's already been observed as not being a very big, impactful nudge. And it is just a little nudge. Haven't you said that? I mean... Not me. <laughs> <laughs> no, because you, you, you were just saying that, you know, it is obvious, because the markets are continuing to behave the way well, they That's are. what somebody told me yeah. today. I, this morning I had to rush off to the... Niti Aayog and I hadn't really gone through every bit of the newspaper. I did quickly glance at it, but... Ma'am, uh, may I come in on the issue of bank deposits, since you said that banks need to do it, and that's absolutely right. But there are two other points uh, the economic survey, uh, the CA new ministry has suggested, that food prices should be excluded from the calculation of the interest rate. In a country like India, it may merit some... Uh, do, do you think that is an idea that should be considered? And secondly, shouldn't banks be offering higher fixed deposit rates? Um, about the economic surveys saying on the inflation and food inflation be segregated, I, first of all, economic survey, although it is from the Department of Economic Affairs, the chief economic advisor prepares it, we maintain an arm's distance from it. So not necessarily a ministry's voice, it is the economic advisor's voice. And on that specific question, I think it is a um, discussion-worthy subject. It is not as if I can take a call on, on it straight away, or no one can take a call on it, because these are issues where a lot more thought has to be uh, taken up. I mean, a lot of mind application is required before we even conclude this way or that. Uh, deposit rates of the that the banks are offering? I think to a large extent banks have been given the liberty to sort of adjust and give more or less as they deem fit over and above the rate. So whether the banks are using that little margin that has been given to them is something which is important for us to know. Ma'am, since uh, the central thrust was on jobs, and ultimately it comes down to investment. I just want to walk across to our budget dashboard and take you through, uh, you know, what, what I know has been of deep concern to you. Uh, the fact that you're waiting for India Inc. to step up to the investment plate and really start investing in the India story, benefit from the corporate tax breaks that you gave them. And I want to look at uh, capacity utilization. If we look at capacity utilization as an aggregate for industry, in certain sectors, of course, it's gone up to the 80s and a new investment cycle has started. But by and large, going back to 2022, capacity utilization has been a flat line. It's tending just a very, very flat line. As finance minister, when you look at the capacity utilization curve on a quarterly basis, what are you making of this? Because everything you could have potentially done, reducing corporate rates, uh, ensuring that balance sheets are healthy, nudging investors, speaking to them, cajoling them, you've done all of it. And yet, as an aggregate capacity utilization stays in the mid-70s and is a flat line. How are you now beyond what you've done hoping to address this? I think we also have to understand the background to this. Industry's capacity is increased, keeping very many other considerations also. Today, in India, within India, the issues are there is a reset which is happening in industry. They are looking at Industry 4.0 seriously. A lot of them are trying to reset their own businesses so that productivity gains can be accrued to them. 
to the uncertainty which is external if there are industry which are very export oriented they also see what is happening around in the sense of europe's demand not really picking up red sea situation the decision after the us election results so there are very many serious matter of fact considerations also the way in which yen in japan has been crashing literally so the global situation i think for indian manufacturers is also a point to be considered other than the fact that domestically indian industry both from industry 4.0 lack of manpower which can take care of it and the skilling of employees like i go on repeating in each one of my interaction with media how only 10 days ago we heard lnt say that there are 45000 jobs for which they are not getting the right personnel meaning right people with the right skill sets for them to recruit so your capacity utilization obviously is dependent on so many such factors so i can't say what more does indian industry want for them to now reach 80 or 90 in terms of the capacity utilization so we need to understand i would be more worried if it is coming down yes it is remaining flat broadly is a factor to be kept in mind but it's not coming down is something which we cannot uh, afford to miss ma'am i want to turn the attention of the conversation towards agriculture uh, and in the kisan uh, agriculture panel uh, earlier one uh, point came out over the past 10 years a lot of money has been put into agriculture but if you take a 20 year period the average growth is 3.5% in the 100 rupees every 100 rupees that you spend you directly give agriculture 2.5 then there are subsidies there is rural development so if you all add it up it might become a 10 or 11 or 12 rupees yet why is agriculture in such distress what is at the heart of the problem but well, i wouldn't be able to expand on what is the heart of the problem in Uh, agriculture i can see we jacker seated there but uh, there are quite a few experts who can talk about it but at least broadly i think there is a lot of fragmentation of land holding to the input costs are so fluctuating despite government giving subsidy let us say for fertilizer let us say for farm loans there are still concerns because the extreme climate uh, or weather conditions are also taking a toll monsoon has shifted from the traditionally uh, predicted dates not just for meteorological department because farmers go by their mental calculation also saying ah by next time next week i should get the monsoon i will be ready to keep the land tilled and uh, wait for the sowing that shift in the monsoon cycle is also weighing heavily in the minds of the farmers further we do not probably have climate resilient seed varieties in this country i was happy that day in the budget when i said india's own indigenous indigenously developed climate resistant seed variety both for the farm and also for horticulture for the field crops and horticulture 109 varieties are ready and sooner it will be launched so there are a lot of challenges which with science and technology with uh, let's say overcoming the cost input fluct input cost fluctuation we will have to address so it is not just a question of and i'm not undermining the importance it's not just the question of msp it's also so many other factors which weigh heavily on farmers and also uh, i will concede this i remember in 2015 or 16 because india has a shortage or the demand and supply doesn't meet in terms of the total uh, pulses that we produce we said all right we will give bonus all right we'll procure and uh, made sure the pulse producing areas will increase farmers did a splendid job and we went on a very clear uh, direction to all those procuring agencies saying please procure as much as farmers would come and give it to you no limiting 
some way something went wrong and some farmers unfortunately had to go back and I remember this example from uh, Gulbarga area in Karnataka where tuvar dal is grown and many farmers were unhappy because the procurement didn't happen as they thought it would happen and there were uh, shortcomings. So a government may announce it but in the ground if you don't execute it at every state level with proper mechanism it does suffer and farmer loses the trust saying I grow this but what's the guarantee it will be procured what's the guarantee I'll get a fair price so that is one so this time for sure we have announced that we will procure and the emphasis is both on Dalhan and Tilhan we would want to support both growing pulses because our imports are growing up and we can't afford to have uh, Indian consumption relying on products which come from outside and the imported inflation is also something which adds to the inflation within this country. Ma'am, very quick follow up. Uh, farmers complain that whenever they get an opportunity to earn more because export markets are paying them more, uh, government ends up uh, imposing export curbs. You've been commerce and industry minister, you have dealt with it directly. Is that fair to our farmers? It's not. And I won't have a hesitation in admitting it. But if I turn to Rahul, he'll say, is that fair, uh, is that fair to the consumer? So I'm caught between the two. I want to support the farmer. I don't want unpredictable restrictions on exports. But if in our country market prices go skyrocketing, consumer equally approaches the government saying, what are you doing for me? We are growing in this country, that very particular crop that I need to buy, and you are loving it to go out of the country, you're not selling it to me. So there is this balance which government struggle to achieve. And I'm not saying just our government, most governments have this problem. Ma'am, Rahul Gandhi and the Congress party are promising MSP as a legal guarantee. There are elections in Maharashtra, Jharkhand, Haryana in a few weeks from now. Are you concerned in the demand, particularly from Punjab and Haryana, where farmers are asking for MSP as a legal guarantee for the number of crops on which MSP is given to be expanded, that this could be politically expensive for your government? How do you intend to deal with this uh, balloon that the opposition has floated? No, so long as they answer questions about the promise that they're giving. I'll put it this way. MSP per the advice given by Swaminathan committee. C2 plus, I think, 50%. When was the Swaminathan Committee report submitted? During UPA time. And was it submitted a month before they left? No. Years before they left. If they thought it was proper, if they thought it could be implemented, why didn't they implement it at that time? And now to come and shed crocodile tears and say, we'll implement the... Swaminathan committee recommendations and put it as a promise. Okay, don't constantly say, you've been here 10 years, don't point a finger, a finger at us 10 years ago. Do it in Himachal Pradesh, pray. Do, in, do it in Karnataka, pray. Who's stopping you? Show it there. Benefit the farmers there and say we proved in one of the states where we are here in power, we'll now do it for the entire country. You don't do it in one state where you are in power, but you want to lecture to the whole country. Ma'am, Ajay Veer Jakar, who you mentioned was a farming expert, has a question for you. Mr. Jakar, please go ahead. Uh, thank you for your clarity on questions on farmers that the panel's posed for you. Uh, <clears throat> a fact and a question. Uh, investment on agriculture research and development gives 10 times return compared to other investments. And over the last 20 years, irrespective of which government has been in power, there's, there's been no real increase in agriculture research and development. So that's a fact. The question is, 
does and can the Ministry of Finance allocate resources for a particular subject if the particular ministry does not ask for it? Because this I think... This time I've done it for agriculture. And the agriculture minister himself had suggested it, Shivraji Chauhan, who himself has shown in his state as to how procurement, particularly wheat, he beat all other states and did the maximum procurement and also he's known for some innovative ways of supporting farmers. So we have given this time, please sit, we have given this time for agriculture research. We, I've sat in meetings before this budget was prepared on how the Indian Council for Agriculture Research actually hasn't got enough money. They just scrape through to pay the salaries. We've made provision this time for agriculture research. We want to strengthen the, um, the network of KBKs, which are all over the country, Krishi, Vigyan, Kendra, so that that outreach work which has to happen through the Krishi, Krishi Vigyan Kendra for the farmer to get information on crop pattern or on better quality seeds or anything else that he wants from the government. They are the centers to do it. So we will be strengthening KBKs. We've also allotted money for Indian Council for Agriculture. Ma'am, I want to come to the question of disinvestment. Uh, when Chief Minister Narendra Modi came to the India Day Conclave in 2013, he said the government has no business of being in government, right? And uh, therefore, the whole idea was that this would be a leaner government, smaller government, you'd get out of business. Now, if I look at disinvestment estimates and realizations, you know, for example, in financial year 21, you estimated that you'll pick up 1.2 lakh crores from uh, disinvestment. The actual realization was only 27% that the target subsequently kept coming down. So did the realization in financial year 25, it came, 24, it came down to 30,000 crores with the realization coming down to 55%. Now it seems as if the budget makers have almost given up on the, uh, on the disinvestment project. Now why? Because when you tried to disinvest Air India, which was a very tricky disinvestment, you were able to find the political wherewithal to be able to go out into it. So if you decide to do it, you found a way of doing it. Why are you not demonstrating the similar wherewithal determination to disinvest other PSUs, which the government really, frankly, ought not to be in the business of running or has said in the past that they're wanting to disinvest? Is this because of elections, politics? backlash? Are you concerned that this may come down to reservation? Why is the government no longer bullish and aggressive about disinvestment? Even when we were moving ahead with Air India, we were not bullish and moving ahead and with that kind of a josh which Rahul can display. Uh, but it is a fact. No, we have not changed the philosophy. We are with it. After all, the public sector enterprises policy was part of my budget speech of 21. And we continue to be on that route because that was approved in the parliament. Um, so the question about why are you not, disinvestments does, don't happen like that. You have to do a lot of preparatory work for each company with each department and only prime it so that they can go into the market. And for each one, they have unique issues to be sorted out. And, and, and of course, the first one, which I will ensure that nothing wrong goes uh, into the deal, is to ensure the workers who are in it, their work uh, conditions, their safety, their uh, continuity in the job, and so on. So I, I will unhesitatingly give you an example. That is only to say that one unique situation, but several situations which are unique to each problem are reasons why you have to take more time, other than, of course, choosing your time to go to the market when you want to do it. Many of the companies which deal with public money have still not had professional managerial structures. Governance within them is to run the company, run it well, all right, but that which is required for it to be taken to the market may not be in place. I'm not faulting them. The work culture over the last 70 years has been run the company, give dividend to the government, take care of your workers, it's all fine. I'm saying do all that and do something more. 
and that something more is make your institution have some fundamental things which when you go to the market are questions asked. First of all, inside your company, within your company, if you internally don't even have a mechanism to value your company. Valuation mechanisms being absent in some of them. We had to spend a lot of time to get them in place. And that takes time. And when I say, uh, when I say it takes time, not just a month or two, sometimes it takes a full year. So the long and short of it is we are on course, we will be doing it. And even otherwise, between the last year and now, you don't seem to remember other than Air India, there are few, quite a few things which have happened. So we are on course. Sort of. Ma'am, one of the key uh, plus points of this budget has been the accelerated dis uh, the fiscal deficit target, which you set, 4.9%, when the expectation was a little higher. Uh, now, that has, of course, gone down very well with the markets as well. Uh, how much has the RBI dividend this year helped in terms of figuring that out? And the second part of that question is, now that you've stuck to the fiscal deficit uh, consolidation path, are you hopeful that the RBI will take a cue when the MPC meets the next time? I won't be able to answer that. That's obviously for RBI to take a call. But uh, a dividend or no dividend, haven't we shown our commitment in keeping the glide path that we had promised? It is a word given after COVID, when we really couldn't uh, but borrow and as a result of fiscal deficit, with revenues going down badly, fiscal deficit went 9.5 or something. So at that time, we promised that we shall get it down a certain path, and we are keeping in line with that path. So I would think, you, instead of being surprised, you should say, all right, we've noticed that you've kept your word. Ma you've heard many questions. Ab kuch gana ho jai. And I'll tell you, how, don't look so surprised, you know, because we've got Vijay Kedia here. He's a stock market investor. He's a guest oftentimes on Business Today television. And he's sung a song. He's actually gone and prepared, rehearsed, riyaz kar kya hai. Unko FM ko ek gana suna hai. Ma'am, aap ki permission ho to? Ishaar. Yes, sir. Go on. Thank gana you, ho jai. Yeah. Achha, when we said ki kuch gana ho jai, ma'am was so spooked. She thought, oh, these guys have gone crazy. They're asking me to sing. No, no. We're doing no such thing. But yes, Kedia sir. Okay, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Rahulji. So, uh, I'm, I'm an investor into stock market, ma'am, for the last 30, uh, more than three decades. So, I'm not, uh, not uh, going to discuss anything about uh, STT or LTCG or STCG in this song. So, just a simple thing. So, the song is like this. And I've written this song, ma'am, three years back. And I posted many times on Twitter to you. So, today I got this opportunity to sing in front of you. <laughs> uh, it's in Hindi, ma'am. So, pardon me for that. It's in Hindi. <clears throat> Kehna hai, kehna hai, kehna hai, kehna hai. Aaj madam se pehli baar ho dividend ke upar leti ho madam tax bar bar. So now what madam says? Boli. Madam Hamse, my magan, don't you worry. Betty, who my carne, sari chinta, do the ten tillion ki economy, ho rahi hai tayar. That is all right, madam, but. Dividend ke upar leti ho, madam. Thank you, bar bar. Thank you. Thank you so much. So that was interesting. I'm sure Nirmala ji has dealt with many curveballs and questions. Aisa aapke liye kabi gana kisi ne ga kis sunaye? So this is like a. So that's like a a first. Now, uh, Raj Chingappa has a question. Raj Chingappa is the editorial director at India Today magazine. Um, he has a question for the finance minister. Raj. Finance minister, two qu uh, quick questions. One is you had mentioned rationalization. 
And if you look at the personal income tax uh, structure versus the corporate income tax structure, you brought down the corporate tax from 30% to 22% effective rate, 25%. If you look at, you have made concessions in this budget uh, to the so-called middle class. The definition, of course, is always very vague. But why isn't, why aren't you moving towards a rationalization of bringing, after 15 lakhs, a person pays 30% according to your new rates? Why aren't you bringing it down to 25% so that a lot of people, you could have a high net worth individual and keep him or her at 30% or whatever. But the bulk of the middle class, the, the, particularly the metros and others, have this kind of income and they feel that 30% is very high but with uh, the surcharges it goes up to 36 or whatever it is. That's for question number one. And two, because uh, uh, you know the most audacious scheme you've started with the uh, internship, uh, in corporates, 500 top corporates, and the fact is that you're taking close to 10 million internees. What is not clear is the kind of setup you have to firstly select. You said it's disadvantages. Who will select these candidates? And second, you had said it was voluntary for the corporates to do so. But I've just read uh, uh, probably a statement of the finance secretary, I don't know whether that's right, that there would be a quota system for these corporates. That is that in some senses, you know, you're directly telling them, pressurizing them that this is your quota and you must do it. So two questions, one on personal income tax and rationalization and why aren't you bringing that uh, ceiling, you know, raising the ceiling much higher so that uh, people can benefit and more money can come in for consumption. Not just the rates. Haven't I increased the standard deduction from 50,000 to 75,000? That will definitely benefit the salaried class. Not just looking at can 30 be brought down to 25, but there's something done there as well. And that is going to benefit purely the salaried persons. Because this would then have a cascading effect even on the higher net worth individuals. So that's one. And second, you asked me now about, in your second question. Uh, the uh, two, two points on that one is in terms of the fact that it could be a quota system, ha. right? No, and uh, also, which agency? After all, you have to select uh, 10 million. Who would be doing that? That's right. And the criteria. Yeah, but uh, we, I would say I'll have to have the budget passed and post which the details of it will be worked out. All right, if one of the secretaries go sort of given you an indication of how it's going to go, but I don't think it's finalized yet. We still think it is going to be a nudge. We are not imposing on anybody. But haven't the industry themselves been saying that we don't seem to have right skilled people coming uh, for jobs? So they will need to now ramp up on training people so that it, for them it may be one or two each, meaning eventually if they have to recruit somebody. But in the market, you need to have right skilled people available for a, anyone to pick up. So skilling and apprenticeship, getting to know what happens in such companies and therefore getting that exposure are very important. Ma'am, uh, Salman Shows is an international development economist. He's also a member of the Congress Party's professionals wing. He has a question from across the political aisle. So some of what we'll potentially see in Parliament, we'll get a glimpse of that. Salman. Dear Balaji, it's, uh, it's good to be here with you in person. I've debated you on television many years back, and uh, you were a formidable opponent. Respectful, but formidable. So uh, I'm sure that uh, when I ask you my question, you'll be similarly respectable, respectful and formidable. Now, uh, and by the way, congratulations on your sixth budget. It's good to see a fellow spokesperson become a Minister of Finance. Aapke liye hope hai abhi. Abhi hamane both hope hai. Uh, you saw Rahul's uh, uh, dashboard and of course, investment, private investment is a big concern because without investment, there will be no jobs. We can create as many incentive schemes, as many internship schemes. It's not going to really work because frankly, if uh, businesses need people, they don't need the government to tell them you need people. They need people, they'll invest. But the challenge is that despite the tax cuts that the BJP government enacted, uh, I think over our objections, let me add, uh, the private sector has not really come forward with uh, uh, you know, major boost in private investment. 
and have not created the kinds of jobs that we hoped for. The economic uh, uh, survey says that, and of course, uh, this is government's data, that uh, the, the profits have basically quadrupled for the corporate sector. They've quadrupled their pro uh, profits, just with the, of course, with the tax cuts, but there's no uh, rise, that kind of rise that we want to see in investments. Now, as someone who's sitting where you are, and I'm hoping that in the future there will be a Congress-led India government what would you tell us to watch out for when you come up with something like a private sector tax cut and investment is still not happening? What would you suggest to us to watch out for so that we have a better result than you did? No, that's difficult to say because the intention with which we offered that in 2019 was we had inherited a twin balance sheet problem. I had to address that. And we did try between 2014 and 19 to address the problem of recognize that there are M NPAs. Try to get solutions for them. And that's where the four R's or five R's, which were very clearly said by the banking, by RBI, by government and everyone. And also from the point of view of the banks, we had to sit with them to convince them because if we talked about ours, they talked about the three C's which they were scared of, the CBI, CVC, and the um, uh, commissioner, vigilance commissioner. So we had to sit with them to say, we assure you, if you take commercially viable decisions and purely for commercial business, why would we want to have any of the C's coming up to you? So it required so many different efforts at so many different levels. And eventually, you had the banks sort of standing up much before they could start running. Equally, the balance sheet of the companies were totally ridden because of the kind of unhealthy loans that they had extended. Who were to run and get it all retrieved? The banks were to do it. They will continue to do it. But till then, they were making provisions also. The banks were making provisions because they had to account in their books for it. So it was a larger attempt to have the economy sit up, stand up, and then start sprinting. So it wasn't a gift given to anybody, but it was certainly a medicine given to an economy which was in desperate say, straits. You had a fragile file situation. Let us say whatever you want about the UPA 10 years, you gave us a baby which was sick totally. And I had to have so many different solutions. And today you're now fastest growing, for not for nothing. So you can always pick up one particular thing and say, oh, you gave a bonanza for the companies. But companies were in such a state that they couldn't have even set up. Banks were in such a state. So how do you start working on the economy? So this corporate uh, tax rate reduction is not for the favor. It is an enlarge for a sick economy. You know, in the highly politically polarized times that we live in, I think the finance minister deserves a round of applause for agreeing to take a question from the opposition. And I think that's special uh, because I know many politicians who wouldn't be very happy with that, uh, but I really appreciate the grace that she's shown. Uh, Sakshi Batra is a stock market anchor on Business Today Television. We're running out of time, okay? So we're just about winding up very quickly now. Uh, she has a question. Yes, Good evening, ma'am. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, women uh, investors in, in India, they're very happy because you cut the customs duty on gold, so they're able to buy gold at a you know, much cheaper rate than it was existing before. I want to ask you, but do you fear a risk of higher import bill as far as gold is concerned because of this? And would it be sustainable for you to keep the customs duty at 6%? looking at the higher international prices and because of the lower customs duty that uh, you could run the risk of higher gold import bill and could it also override the crude import bill at that point in time? Thank you. Uh, India's customs duty on gold, I've gone back till 1947. There have been times when it has gone up, there's been times when it's come down and uh, equally, it's not a secret, all of us know. The thirst for investing in gold 
investing, I say loosely. It's not really investing. You want to save and keep gold. And there's a lot of sentiment about gold in homes. So with all this in my mind, I say, I've gone back to look at how the basic customs duty on gold has been. Has it been always kept high? Has it been low? There have been days when they've been very high, when they brought it down and so on. And equally, because of this thirst, any arbitrage created results in smuggling. That's also there. So India's gold is a very interesting affair. Yes, the question of uh, foreign exchange. But I think today our macroeconomic situation is fairly comfortable. And there, uh, there's our decision. Ma'am, we're almost at the end. Just two very quick final questions and then we wrap up. The first on China. And we're wondering if there is some level of rethink within the Modi Sarkar on how to view investments from China. Post Galwan, the government took a very strong position, actively pushed back against Chinese FDI, against Chinese investments in the Indian startup sector. Now we've heard from the chief economic advisor and we've seen some other signs as well through modifications of press notes where the idea seems to be that it's better to allow FDI from China so that there is investment in India, manufacturing in India, there's jobs in India. Otherwise, the trade imbalance with China just keeps getting worse. So is there a gradual thawing and a gradual rethink on how to view investments from China? There's been some discussion in some parts of the government about issuing visa for people who, technocrats who can come from China for some businesses, large setting up of units and so on. But they are discussions. And in some parts of the government, nothing before me. And on the FDI, no, there's nothing at all which I can talk about. Ma'am, Rijiju ji, who's the parliamentary affairs minister, has just tweeted while the show was on, Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman ji will give the Indy Alliance an appropriate dose of medicines on the 30th of July. What appropriate dose of medicines are you going to give Salman Bhai and Ishtar? I don't know. I, I will have to ask Kiran if he's got some suggestions. But I have not applied my mind yet on my reply. You said I'm listening to the debate, uh, the different parties, different MPs talking about it. That I'm... Are you looking forward to this debate on the finance bill? You said that the opposition is more aggressive than in the past? No, that's all right. That's their posturing. That that's the way they want to handle it. But it's my duty and I look forward to giving reply. I don't think there are too many ministers in this government or politicians in India per se who would be willing to take the wide swath of questions that Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman has so ably dealt with from songs and thank you for that song. Kedia Saab, he'll be like when the markets open, he'll be much discussed on Monday. And uh, you know, we're glad that we we're able to deal with the farm sector as well. So Mr. Jakar, thank you for that. For all of you who joined us here, thank you very much. And can we have a very, very big warm round of applause as we thank Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman thank you very much. for having thank you. joined us here. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much.